KNAC.com, the loudest.com on the planet. I have the pleasure today of speaking with Mike Spritzer of Devil Driver. How you doing, brother? I'm doing pretty good. How you doing? Hanging in there, man. You have Dealing with Demons, Volume 1, coming out next month. Uh, it's a one of a two-part release that you guys have coming out. Uh, tell us a little bit about, about the album and uh, what are you expecting? Dealing with Demons is probably uh, my most favorite record the band has done since our third record, The Last Kind Words. It seemed to come together. It was a very organic record in the way that it everything just melted together very nicely. You know, with me, Neil, and Austin are the core writers now for the music. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, Des is, is, is the only you know, works on the lyrics on his own, but it was a very it, it was a, a very fun record for us to work on. And there was no arguments. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of different ideas floating around and a lot of different ideas, you know, with, you know, the wrong group of people together can result in animosity, arguments, bitterness. And with these two records, that never happened. There was never an argument. There were lots of different suggestions going around and everyone is very accepting of other people's ideas especially, you know, you know, we brought in Steve Evitz this time and Steve is an amazing produce, producer. I never want to work with another producer ever again. I think every mm -hmm. record from here on out will be with Steve. I hope, I hope it is. And he made us get into a room, me, Austin, Neil and him for two, two weeks. And I don't think we ever took a day off in those two weeks. We just worked every day playing the songs together i usually don't learn all you know all the other songs on a record because i won't be recording them in a lot of cases you know it, back in the day you know berklin would record his own riffs jeff would record his own riffs and i w there was no point for me to take the time and learn them i would focus on the songs that i was going to be recording and but steve insisted that both neil and i learn all the material so we can play it together with Austin and him in pre-production. And I was hesitant to do that at first, but Steve with his uh, Jedi powers pulled a <laughs> mind trick on me. And next thing I knew, I knew all the songs and it did make a, a big difference in the long run, especially with the drums. Austin is the one that got worked the hardest in pre-production and I think it shows on the record. Very good. So this is kind of a, a new venture as far as being more involved, because not only with the songwriting, but you also helped engineer the album too, right? Not so much, actually. There was a, I don't know how it came about. It said in the original press release that I co-produced this record with Steve, and that was definitely not the case. I don't know how ah, that okay. happened. How that happened. Okay. Now, and especially on this record, because... It, on past records, you know, we would take a lot of, not rhythms, but overdubs and, you know, leads and whatnot, clean parts that I have recorded in my studio during, while we were doing the demos. And a lot of times we would just make the, mix those parts down and stick them on the record because, you know, we were always happy with the way it sounded. We had listened to it that way. And, you know, you get that something that a lot of musicians like to call demoitis where you listen to the demo mm -hmm. so many so many times that it's hard for you to listen to things with a different tone mm. you know when you're going to do the record but in this case you know we re-recorded almost every overdub we didn't use much of what i had recorded in in my studio and Steve has a very analog way of doing things in some cases. We did right. use my ax effects on, on a few overdubs, but mm -hmm. for the most part, it, it's, he's got this massive pedal collection at his studio and mm -hmm. he would just literally sit down on the floor with all these pedals while Neil and I were playing the guitar and just try different things. And mm -hmm. I think that it was a lot more fun to do it that way, and I think we got better mm. results. So you went for a different guitar tone on this one, then? 
Yeah, and actually every song has a different combination of rhythms on it. This is the first oh. time where Neil played on one side the rhythms and I played the rhythms on the other side and we used uh, different guitars, different overdrive pedals on different amps and sometimes even different speaker cabinets with different microphones oh. on one side as opposed to the other. And Steve wanted to, to do it that way because when you listen to me and Neil play, which, you know, I've noticed since Neil jo joined the band that he gets a lot more low end out of his right hand than I do, you know, and I get this more uh, piercing high end out of it. And he just thought that the two would mesh really well together. And that's what we did. He told me that if, Neil and I had a very similar playing style when it comes to rhythm playing. He probably would have had one person play both rhythms on a given song. But in our case, he wanted to try it, and I think it ended up working out really well. That's awesome, awesome. Did it, did it take long for you and Neil? Because and like, uh, since about 2016, you guys had a pretty steady lineup. Did it take a while um, to reach this point where you guys are so comfortable working together, or did that come on early? It came on very early. Me, Neil, and Austin, in the six years they've been in the band, we've never been into a single argument in the studio or out on tour. We just get along really, really well. Mm. And it, uh, you know, it followed suit into the recording process. And you know, it's, a, it's a nice thing because we really ex respect and welcome everyone's ideas. Mm -hmm. and there's no animosity or bitterness when suggestions are made or someone even says, I don't like that. And I trust their opinion so well that I'm very indecisive sometimes when I'm writing. Sometimes I know exactly what I want, but then sometimes I'll have like three to five different ideas for something and I can't decide. So now rather than trying to make that decision myself, I'll just wait until the guys come over, show them my ideas and usually Austin and Neil are on the same page where they're just like, we like option B and C the best and go with that. And I won't think about it, even their answer. I'd be like, great. I mean, I like mm -hmm. all the ideas and I can't decide, but if you guys like this idea the best, then we're going to go with that. And mm -hmm. it makes things easier for me. And like I said, it's just a lot of fun working with those guys. And our producer, Steve, is really close to us. He's only about a half hour away from me. And he's become a very close friend of mine. And, you know, we keep in touch on a regular basis. And we just can't wait. We can't wait to do it again and getting back into a studio together. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I think uh, having a good camaraderie, it, it helps the working relationship because you can bounce ideas back and forth. You, you know, you can have a little bit of, uh, I, I guess, uh, if there's any question of hesitation in your mind, you can kind of turn to somebody and that you trust and kind of get their feedback, right? It helps the, the process along. Yes, it does. And I think you end up with a, with better material in the long run, at least for me, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's people out there that write better on their own, but I have found that in a lot of cases I do work better collaborating with other people, as long as it's the right people. And right. Neil, right. Neil and Austin are definitely the right people for me to be collaborating with. Right. And, that, and that's not to say, like, you know, without going into too much detail, but in prior records with prior lineups, there was a little bit of a rough tread, I guess, to, like, get to from point A of writing to the finished product. Because, um, I mean, you've been with Devil Drivers since, like, the second album. We're talking yes. about, like, uh, 2005. So you've been through practically the whole lifespan of the band. So you've seen the evolution with members and the, al and the albums you put out. So it's definitely changed, right? Yeah, it definitely has changed. Me and Berklin bumped heads a lot when we were writing together. He always had more of a thrashy uh, way of going about things. And I had a, more of a European, like especially like, you know, when you think of like Scandinavian bands, like In Flames and Opeth and... Mm -hmm. Um, at the gates, and even though they're not from Scandinavia, you know, mm -hmm. Carcass is another example. But I had a, a writing style that was more similar to that, you know, I would say almost like neoclassical in a way, mm -hmm. you know, very melodic, 
triumphant type rips. Mm-hmm. And um, Brooklyn wasn't really into that. And so we bumped heads a lot. But the funny thing is, is now that he's not in the band anymore, I, I think it's actually brought us a little bit closer. You know, obviously we don't see each other a lot, but mm-hmm. now that we don't have to work together, we could just focus on being <laughs> friends. And, you know, we, we keep in contact quite a bit. That's good, that's good. Especially, especially with these difficult times, it's important to like you know reach out to people in contacts and just you know, um, you know, with people listening might not realize that like we're going through an odd little pandemic here, so we're kind of, I don't know if you want to say enforced or encouraged to like keep your distance from people, but you know, you, like you point out, you you guys are uh, are better friends now, and now that you're not working together, but yeah and i think that happens the other thing too is like you you know we were in a band together when we were in our early 20s -hmm. you know all the way to the point where in our early 30s and let's just face it when you're in your 20s you're you're still pretty stupid (laughs) and i don't think you've really discovered who you are with you're more hard-headed and i would say at least we were and You know, we were in a band even, you know, together for a short time, even before Devil Driver. And before that, we, you know, I've been friends with those oh, wow. guys since I was 18 years old. You know, we all met. Oh, it. Right on. Uh, I met all of them when I was in college. And um, so I think we're, even if we were in a band now and more mature, I think, unfortunately, you carry the last 10 years with you one way or another and how you you know, a lot of times it was my fault, you know, and sometimes it was Berkman's fault, you know, for bumping heads in the writing process. But I think when Neil and Austin got thrown into the mix, it it was like you get to start over again. And, you know, subconsciously, I think I looked at what how I acted in the past with the old members and, you know, and realized, like, I don't want to repeat that. So I'm going to try to keep more of an open mind and... I think we were treading so lightly with one another, me, Austin and Neil, where it's like, we just got into throwing a room together and said, start writing a record. And we didn't know each other. We had, you know, we had known each other for maybe a week (laughs) at that Mm -hmm. point. And, but that vibe has continued forward ever since we started writing together. You know, we're just very open to each other's ideas and we don't, you know, get, offended or become bitter about other people's suggestions even when it comes to the point where we're like man i really don't like that song or i don't like that riff and you know can we do things a different way can we speed it up can we right, right. you know play it you know tune it down a lot you know it's another thing we did on this record was we played a lot of songs with baritone guitars tuned to drop a oh. Oh. and there was always like a song or you know or here and there on other records that was tuned down to that tuning but I want to say there's at least five or six between these two records that we did that. And we did, that's another thing that we discovered in pre-production, you know, it was starts playing it and it's like, ah, this needs to be sped up. This needs to be faster. And, or, you know, how about we try this song on the baritone, see how it sounds. And whenever we made that suggestion, it always worked. I think there was one song that we tried to do tuned down and we we're like, Nope, it's better the other way. Hmm. You point out some interesting aspects, like, uh, you know, the maturity level of when you're uh, 20 to, like, now, and you understand things a little bit better. Your musical tastes obviously expand more, and but you learn how to uh, approach each other instead of saying, like, oh, no, this sucks. No, don't do that. Or you know how to talk to somebody. It's like, hey, how about this? Let's try this. You know Exactly. And, yeah, It's not what you're saying. It's how you say it a lot of times. Right, you know, if you true. say it in a, in a right way, you know, you can never say, that risk sucks. Yeah, you know? that's the worst thing you All can right. say. That is, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people have done that. I've done that. People have done it to me. And it's mm-hmm, guilty. Immediate, yeah, and immediately <laughs> a wall goes up between yeah. you and that person. Mm-hmm. And... Like I said, it's just something that you learn over yeah. time. And there's a lot of little different things that, you know, I could get into, but that's just one of many. Yeah. And then, and then you know, that, that can easily translate to, like, you know, modern day just conversation being out in the streets and just everyday life. You know, common courtesy and just know how, how to approach a situation. That is, of course, if you want to have a dialogue with somebody. But if not, you know. Yeah. yeah and I've had people come up to me in situations and being like, well, why don't you call this person out on that? And it's just because I pick and choose my battles now. And it's like, 
Mm-hmm. Is, is this battle a big enough deal for me to actually start a war? And mm-hmm. most of the time, it's not. You know, it's just mm-hmm. I've learned to let things go better than I did in my 20s. And, you know, I think a lot of people, will be, you know, start to uh, feel that way as they get older. Oh, totally. Totally. The maturity level needs to, like, really, uh, you know, be more than it is nowadays. But uh, the, uh, you mentioned uh, Battleground. And when I think of music, I kind of think of the stage as a battleground. And the recording studio is your battleground. You take all that energy, that angst, that anger, frustrations, um, even the joys and happiness that you're feeling, you put it into the studio and you think you're, you think all of you collectively are, have put your all into this album. There is a lot of energy put into this record. You know, it's, it's 20 songs, you know, our producer, Steve Evans, and once he was done mixing, you know, he told me that he's like, man, I, I don't know if I'll ever do a double record with any band ever again, <laughs> because You'd probably spend maybe two to three weeks mixing a record. You know, you you get the first mix to the point where the band is happy, and then every mix after that is a lot easier because mm-hmm. you know you have your template. But you know, and I've mixed records, and you know, I don't think I've ever done more than twelve or thirteen songs. I can't imagine doing twenty. I mean, it, that is a lot of material, and. Mm-hmm. With 20 songs, even if you're doing a song a day, you know, you got to take at least one day off a week to let your brain and ears rest. Otherwise, I think you could start be um, doing yourself a disservice by just Mm -hmm. trying to crank them out all at once. I mean, you literally need to give your ears a rest and you can Mm -hmm. only mix so many hours a day until your ears get fatigued and and you're probably going to make start making bad decisions. So yeah. I, I want to say it probably took Steve about a month to to mix the record. And it's got to start getting monotonous at that point. So, you know, it was a huge undertaking for the band as well as our producer, Steve. Now, now was this record, did you have, have it complete before this whole uh, lockdown pandemic bullshit? Or, or were you guys still working? It, it was completely done, I would say, almost a year before the pandemic hit and wow. yeah i was all said and done you know we originally i think we were originally going to try to release it the end of this year in the last quarter but you know we had to cancel some tours we right. had to cancel a couple of cruises and Ooh. you know oh, wow. does his wife you know, had a cancer scare had and we cancer. had to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, she, but she's okay, you know, but it, it, Great. It, it's something that could have been really bad, but they caught it really, really early and she's, oh, she's okay. That's, that's great. But to we hear. had to, yeah, we had to cancel the tour because of that. And, you know, obviously that pushed everything back because, you know, Des had to put life on hold and support his mm-hmm. wife. Of course. But yeah, it was all mixed and even mastered. Um, well before the pandemic hit and the f- releasing keep away from me the first you know the first, si- the first single, single that that was just an amazing coincidence because that song was already named and it had been decided that that was going to be the, the first single off the record before the pandemic mm-hmm. hit but we did use you know what's going on with the pandemic to you know for the face of the the music video mm-hmm. with that song but a lot of people think that song was released for you know because of the pandemic <laughs> and that we recorded it but you know there's no way that things can happen that fast between mm-hmm. when we re- released it and when the pandemic hit there was just you know for us anyway not enough time well i mean I, I understandably like us as metal musicians we kind of there's a little bit of predictability i mean because if you look at all the records that have been released over the decades and stuff like that, you know, although the song titles might change, the album titles might change, members might change, but like sometimes the story stays the same, you know, and it's part of the lyrical content that a lot of people gravitate towards because it just it transcends time, you know, and, and it's, it is a funny coincidence that you put out that single and it just kind of applies to now, you know. And, it does, and yeah. I still can't believe it. It's... <laughs> You know, anyone in our generation or the prior generation, you know, they, they've never had to deal with anything like this. I mean, there have True. been pandemics in the past, but, you know, it's 
different times a lot you know the the world is much more crowded and people are traveling a lot more Mm -hmm. than they were during previous ones and the fact that we (laughs) that des named a song keep away from me when all the social distancing Mm -hmm. crap is in effect is pretty ironic yeah you know, another thing about metalheads is we're kind of like individualists in some way. Like, you know, we do like to keep to ourselves and we only gravitate towards those that we can relate to. And whether it's bands or other metalheads, it's like, you know, we, we're a tight little little community, you know, but. We, yeah, we, we are. And I can't believe how small it was. You know, when I first joined this band, you know, I didn't really think about it. But just after touring for like five years, like you really you keep on bumping into the same people and after mm-hmm. about a decade in it, you pretty much, you know, one way or another, you've toured with probably at least 50% of the people that are out there doing it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for the fans, it's more of a religion, which makes me happy because I think, you know, I, I want to say that our genre is going to get up, back up and running to the point where it was before faster than other genres, because, just the fact that it's more like a religion to us than other fans of other genres, you know, people need it in their life more than others. And it's what keeps them happy. It's what keeps them going. So I think when shows start opening up and there's a vaccine out there, um, I think it's going to, it's going to be fast. Totally. And you know, people, you know, both fans and bands are just, at the starting gate, ready to just you know unload and get crazy in the in, in live concerts and man, that can't happen soon enough, man. You know, I know I speak for a lot of people that say we miss playing live, we miss going to live concerts, and um, you know it's it's pretty great that bands like you and like Devil Driver are putting out music during this time because that is really gonna help. It really does help people get through this. It does, and you know, me included. You know, I'm lucky enough to have, have I was able to hear the new uh, Marilyn Manson record. Nice, and it's absolutely incredible. It's the best thing that he's released since Hollywood. And the fact that that album came out during the pandemic that I mean, I'm a massive man, massive Marilyn Manson fan, yeah. and he. Um, you know, it's just he, I found stuff that he's liked or that he's released, you know, a song or two on each record. And I think it's slowly been getting better since he released Eat Me, Drink Me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I was not a fan of that record at all. And mm-hmm. but this record is something special, man. And the fact that it came out during the pandemic makes me very happy because it, it's going to be a record that's going to be on repeat for a long time. Very good, very good. Again, we're talking with Mike Spritzer, Devil Driver. They got the new album coming out, Dealing with Demons, next month. Uh, just for clarity, is it October 2nd or October 9th? It's October 2nd. It was going to come out on the 9th, but we bumped it up a week, and I'm not 100% sure why. <laughs> I've been so busy with other things, I keep on forgetting to ask. And do you have a release date for Volume 2? No. Not yet. Uh, it it was ten- tentatively slated to be released early next year, but I think we're going to wait to see what happens because all of us would really like to be able to do what we're supposed to do and you know actually go out and play shows <laughs> after mm-hmm. we release a record. And we might save it until then, but we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. You know, it's... There's so many unknowns out there. It's it's hard to make any judgment calls. How how long from when you first were recording, writing down ideas for dealing with demons, with writing and then recording and just completion? Writing started. I want to say that I actually wrote the first song for the, for this record in late 2017 or early 2018, and. I believe we finished recording it. Uh, man, everything's blended together so much in the last few years. <laughs> it, it's hard for me to say, but it's mm-hmm. it was finished over a year ago. Mm-hmm. And writing started, you know, two two and a half uh, years ago from now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was we, you know, we weren't rushed. 
on this record, which we've kind of been rushed on previous ones to the point oh. where, you know, I've actually gone in the studio a little bit unprepared because we had mm. finished writing and I wouldn't have a whole lot of time to sit down and practice the songs before we went to the studio. But it was, it was definitely not the case with this record. And we were well prepared and we set aside a lot of time because we knew that we were going to be doing a lot of material to the point where we might be pretty burned out on this record by the time we get it about 60 or 70 percent through it you know it's just like oh my god we still have like five or six more songs to do <laughs> and mm -hmm. it, it could be pretty draining but it took a long time okay. now now as far as the lyrical content goes i know this really hits home for des uh what, what are your thoughts or your perspective can you give us a little insight on the lyrical content um involving dealing with demons you know it's not really my place to talk about the vocals because I'm not around during the you know the writing process of the vocals and sometimes you know I've gone into the studio when Des has been doing vocals but for the most part you know the other thing too is, is Des doesn't really like to start writing until he has a bulk of the material in front of him so we'll send him demos as we get them done but he doesn't really start writing until he has I would say at least 70 or 80 percent of the songs in front of him and then he'll start writing so that's kind of where my job with the record, you know, goes on hold for a little bit mm -hmm. um, because it's like, okay, the writing's done. And in this case, we're just, you know, I'll, I'll still be working on the record and in the aspect I'll be practicing the songs, you know, before we went into pre-production. But as far as lyrical content, that's a question that uh, I think is best left to be answered by Dez. <laughs> I feel you, I feel you. Well, I want to thank you for your time. Um, I know you probably have a schedule ahead of you, but um, again, Mike Spritzer, Devil Driver, dealing with demons through Napalm Records. How's Napalm Records dealing with you guys? Like, they taking care of you guys? Yeah, they've been great. You know, they don't interfere with us artistically whatsoever. And, uh, you know, it's... I still do miss Roadrunner Records, and I miss all the people that uh worked at that label i mean i really miss them a lot because you know they were they were family and it's the dynamic i think of record labels has changed a little bit mm -hmm. since there's a there's not a record label out there i don't think that was like roadrunner you know it's the way they did things and the way they promoted bands and the amount of time they took you know to to be with us when we would be in europe and you know, the States, Australia, you know, wherever they had offices. And it was a really cool thing that I just don't think exists anymore. Mm -hmm. So I do miss that, but Napalm has been a fantastic home for us ever since then. That's great to hear, man. It's great to hear. Well, again, I want to thank you for your time. Um, dealing with Demons coming out very, very soon. Uh, just your final thoughts on this new record, what can you tell the fans, like a, a heads up, what sets this album apart from the rest? It's hard for me to say what sets this album apart from the rest for a, a, a listener's perspective, because I truly believe the artist who writes the music sees the music much differently than people that are absorbing it, that had nothing to do with the writing process. But I can say that if you're into the three songs that we've released so far you're going to like volume one and i i'm very confident that everyone's going to like volume two as well because for me i don't have a favorite record i think they're both great all the songs were written together and so they share a similar vibe as the three songs that we released so if you like what you've heard you're going to like the rest of it you can almost guarantee it Awesome. Outstanding. Can't wait to hear it. Again, this is Francisco with KNAC.com. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at MetalXCandy. And again, thanks for your time. Uh, we look forward to catching you guys on stage again. Uh, please give me a, a give a high horns and a fist bumps to all the Devil Driver camp, especially Des's wife. Uh, much love, and I'm glad she's uh, doing much, much better. And uh, you stay safe, my friend, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah.
Been a pleasure. Talk to you soon, man. Cheers.